Hello, I'm an oscilloscope. An oscilloscope is a device used to monitor an incoming signal. In most cases, an oscilloscope will monitor amplitude over time. Some cases of this include a heartbeat, a wavelength of light, or even music. In other cases, two signals are monitored at the same time. This can be done simultaneously if the scope is dual trace, or it can be done by using the two different signals as X and Y coordinates. That's known as a vector scope, which is a special type of oscilloscope. That's what I am. I'm officially known as the 760A Tektronix Stereo Audio Monitor. There aren't any natural sound generators that create a square. This basically looks like a ramp. You get that out of reed instruments. So that's why uh, a saxophone sounds brighter than a, than a flute. I started a radio repair business before I could drive. And I did, I've done, I did repairs and that's kind of how I put myself through college. And a lot of times I could get instruments because they were broken and you had mm -hmm. to repair them and that kind of stuff. That's Dave Brown. He has worked at Tektronix for 34 years and is now the president of the Tektronix Museum in Beaverton, Oregon. Dave was generous enough to give us a tour of the Tektronix Museum as well as explaining some of the history and background of Tektronix, including the fact that Tektronix has won a total of 13 Grammy Awards. Despite using oscilloscopes for audio, there is so much more that they can be used for. In fact, a large portion of Tektronix was marketed towards television broadcasters. More than anything, Dave considers himself an engineer, although he has a lot of passion for music. Sharing the similarity of being interested in Eurorack modules, I was curious to see how you might use oscilloscopes in conjunction with his modules. I'm not fond of 3.5 millimeter jacks, I'm not fond of little knobs. So I started building my, my 5U system. And I built a nice little 19 inch rack that had 20U and pretty soon that's fallen. So mm -hmm. then I built a little 10U expansion and pretty soon that's fallen. So then I built a wooden cabinet and pretty soon that's fallen. So I just kind of kept going. I'm talking about a oscilloscope, I can talk about how you use them, I can talk about how I use them. Mm -hmm. I don't know how most people use them with a the modular. I don't think they do much with them. Needless to say, this was an answer that I wasn't expecting. Closely following the birth of Modular in 1960, Bob Moog developed one of the first commercially available modular synthesizers. At this point in time, oscilloscopes had been around for almost 60 years. Despite the past, oscilloscopes and synthesis are used in conjunction all the time nowadays. In fact, some synthesizers, like the Korg Prolog, include an oscilloscope in the interface. Speaking of modular synthesis and oscilloscopes being used in conjunction, let me show you a little bit about a module known as the Mordax Data. So if you've ever used a VST such as Serum, you'll notice that there's a lot of LFOs you can use. And this is uh, basically the same thing that's just built into a modular. So the first thing I want to do is actually show you what the oscillator looks like uh, without any LFOs on it. So we'll just take the out here and plug it into uh, our oscilloscope. And then we'll take a second out and plug it into the oscilloscope as well. Uh, you can see actually what it looks like. Now let's see what it sounds like because that's kind of the whole point of an oscillator, right? Is to make sounds. So you can see that the sound that it's creating is kind of corresponding to the oscilloscope here. What if we don't want the audio to be on full gain the entire time? Well, we can do something by using an LFO and adjusting the level here. First of all, let's take a look at what these LFOs look like. Uh, if I take the output of this LFO and put it into our scope here, we can see that it's very short and plucky and transient. We can see that the, the transient is up here and then it slopes down, so it's gonna make a very plucky sound. Now if we resume this, we can see that based on that LFO, we have our waveform changing in amplitude. This is a really cool way to monitor kind of your stereo, but there's also something that's really cool by using an XY scope. So this is what the scope looks like in XY mode, where uh, instead of having uh, both signals routed to their amplitude over time, it's the amplitude on the X and Y scale uh, in respect to the left and right signal. So this is going to be uh, representative of our stereo wideness. So this is a very mono sounding signal, but this is a, a lot more stereo as you can hear. If you're listening with headphones, you'll be able to tell that this sound takes up a lot more uh, stereo wideness. You can feel it uh, on both sides of your ears. So kind of the more extravagant the shape is, the more stereo you're going to hear and that's representative of the stereo wideness of the sound. And basically what that translates to is just these two signals on the left and right are very different. They're not very similar. The more similar the waveform is in both ears, the more mono it is. That's, that's basically the fundamental of what uh, stereo wideness is. So by viewing the oscilloscope and playing the music, we can actually view exactly how much stereo width the sound is taking up by literally looking at the stereo width. The wider that the sound takes up on the axis right here from left to right, 
corresponds to how wide the sound is. Something that's mono, such as my voice, uh, will show up as a vertical line. When you're mixing and mastering, it's kind of important to think about how much stereo space your sound is taking up because it can sound vastly different if you're listening to it on a phone that outputs more of a mono signal or headphones or stereo phones which output a very uh, stereo signal uh, because if you're wearing headphones uh, both left and right channels are going to be uh, heard completely separately from each other well if you're playing it out of your phone left and right signals are going to be more mixed together and you're going to hear them at the same time so say you want to monitor your stereo wideness of your song but you don't have an oscilloscope. That's okay. If you have FL Studio, there's this funny little thing called Wave Candy, which comes free with FL Studio, that has a vector scope preset already saved for your convenience that will allow you to monitor your stereo wideness. Now, you may notice this is a very weird kind of transparent look. Uh, I have an oscilloscope uh, preset saved on my Patreon if you want this preset. Uh, anyways. It works perfectly for monitoring your stereo wideness and there is no need for an analog oscilloscope that's going to cost you $50, $70. And it's all free in FL Studio, so I'd really recommend checking this out. Uh, and it's super awesome that they have it in here. It's kind of hidden away, but it's good that you know. So you may be wondering, well, what is good stereo wideness and what does bad stereo wideness look like? Well, this is an example of what some good stereo wideness looks like. <laughs> Notice most of the sound is consolidated in the top kind of quarter up here and the bottom quarter down here. They're not too much over here, although there is some detail on the very sides of the stereo. And you can see that there are some sounds that take up more mono space, while some that are very wide. In fact, this sound right here is very wide. It takes up a very large amount of stereo space, and that's to give emphasis of this kind of whoosh sound that kind of comes in. You can really mess around with stereo wideness quite a bit and get a lot of different sounds. Now let's take a look at some stereo that sounds bad. So this is our vocal sample right here. You can tell that it's completely mono as it creates a vertical line here. But let's add some stereo wideness to it. Now, how would we do that? Well, one way to do that is using reverb. You can add a very short amount of reverb. You can turn that to wet. And then this is your separation, which is basically your stereo wideness. You can change your size here. And now when we look at it, we can see that it takes a lot more stereo wideness up. But something's off it's a lot more wide than it is mono. And that's something that we want to avoid. We want something to be stereo, but not more stereo than it is mono. We want it to be more mono than stereo in most cases. Of course, there are some things, and if you're experimenting with something, it is totally okay not to follow this rule. But a general rule of thumb is keep something a little bit more mono than it is stereo. So what I would do to fix this is maybe add some more of that dry mono back and then turn the separation here down a little bit so we get more, away, a little bit more of this mono insane. with less of this stereo. That's just gonna give it a little bit more coherence and it's gonna sit better in your mix. Uh, and I've noticed that it's kind of confusing when there's a lot of stereo in your mix. When something's a little bit more mono, it's easier to listen to. While if something's very wide, it's kind of disorienting and confusing to the listener. So that's just something to keep in mind as well. Well, thank you for tuning in to another Luma video. I hope you enjoyed the content. Uh, if you like this video, make sure to hit the like button, hit that subscribe button, uh, Discord, Patreon, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Links, description, you know the deal. Uh, I really appreciate the support I've been getting, and I have a lot of fun talking to you all on the Discord. So uh, with that being said, I'll catch you in the next video, and goodbye.